taking a journey into the future histories with graphic novelist Chief Nyamwea, who will engage us in imagining ourselves as future historians. History may repeat itself, but often in unrecognizable ways. How can African storytellers root, them to, uh, root today's transformative technologies such as Bitcoin in Africa's unique historical context? So Chief Nyamwea is going to tell us more on this. Uh, so welcome, enjoy, and uh, just a quick reminder to put your phones on silent so that we have a fun session without any interruption. So welcome, Chief. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, all uh, of you who've been able to make it this morning. I know that there are a thousand other places, including your blankets, where I would rather be on a Sunday morning. So for those of you who are here, I'm very happy to see you. If you could all come closer to the front so that we can have more of a conversation than a projection, uh, especially the ones who are at the back, because I'd love for you also to be able to communicate with each other. Uh, there's this front row. I'll just pull the... So, future histories or futura historias, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Is there any Portuguese speaker? Uh, we are going to do this over one hour. And let me just, let me just, I don't think I need this since we are, we are a small hall. Okay, I need a microphone. So for the first 20 minutes, we'll talk about historical context. How do you take a snapshot of, of the period in history that you're in? And then for the next 20 minutes, we'll ask us ourselves some key questions about that context. And then for the final 20 minutes, we'll put all our results into some sort of a story structure. Are we together? So I'll start by just telling you a bit about myself. I'm a graphic novelist, which means I create stuff like this. Uh, stories that have pictures in them, narration, research, and a storyboard is, I mean, a graphic novel is a lot like, it's a lot like an animated film that's inside a book. It's in the in-between of an animated film and a normal book. So this is what I do. and. Um, in researching this particular book, I had a lot of experiences. Most notably, I spent some time in Silicon Valley where I was studying the future, basically. And I was looking at how we can apply exponential technologies to you know, solving grand challenges that we are facing in the world right now. And uh, the thing that has surprised me most, the most about the world over the past 20 years that I've been looking at it is how much has changed in terms of technology, in terms of uh, the infrastructure of our lives, and yet how little has changed from a social perspective. And that's what I find to be super interesting. So for the next five interesting, uh, sorry, for the next five minutes, the same way we've, we've, uh, we've heard from me, I'd like you to write down if you can. So for the next five minutes, if you could kindly introduce yourself to the person you're sitting next to, see why I wanted us all to come together, Introduce yourself and explain to them what has surprised you the most, either for good or bad. The good thing you can put down on the, on the green piece of paper, the bad thing you can put on the red piece of paper about the last 20 years of your life. Who's the youngest person? Are we all over 30? Are we all over 30? Is anybody under? Okay, let's work with 20 years. I think that's a good range. Okay, so... Number one, introduce yourself. What is your name? You know, how do you find yourself in Kenya National Theatre this morning? And what is the thing that has surprised you the most about the past 20 years of your life? It can be about your country. It can be about the world as a whole. I don't mind. Just um, what comes to your mind spontaneously as you think about the past 20 years? 
can be an event, it can be any trend that you've observed over the past 20 years. Whichever, whichever. <laughs> so the reason why I put uh, green and red is because stories are really a map of, of um, we'll talk more about this when we go to the story structure, but when you're looking at a story, basically there's a goal, and you're either moving away from that goal or toward that goal. The things that are moving you toward that goal tend to be on the green side, and the things that are moving you away are in the red. So, example, uh, the goal of your story is to stop an explosion happening and blowing up your city. So your goal is to stop the explosion. Anything that makes you, moves you closer to the explosion would be in the red. Moves you away would be in the green. Is that clear? Okay. I mean, when I look at, when I, look at uh, I can tell you about my own experience looking at the past 20 years. Uh, it's been, it's been, it's been really mind-boggling when, when I look at um, especially how exponential technologies have been converging, how they've been coming together. That's uh, things like AI, things like virtual reality, digital fabrication, being able to, to print 3D objects, um, really mind-boggling. And um, it's, it should have been very hard retrospectively, it should have been very hard to see all these changes coming. It's also quite disappointing. I thought by now we'd have time machines and uh, you'd be able to, you know, 3D print food, that type of thing. Um, I'm, quite, I'm quite surprised that we're still reading books as we're reading, and I'm surprised even that I'm producing books. We all had, we all had a certain picture of how the present would look, and we've deviated from that somewhat. Has everybody written? Okay, I'll give you five minutes. If you need any help, please raise your hand. Yes. Could somebody pass a microphone to the back? Okay. Uh, don't worry so much about the color distinction. I was just making it interesting for you. If it's things that you're happy about, you can write on the green. You, if it's things that you're unhappy about, you can write on the red. And that becomes useful much later here. But for now, just think about what has surprised you the most. There are many ways of thinking about this, if you'd like some help. I usually use this uh, acronym, PESTEL. Has anybody heard of PESTEL before? I'm sure you have. PESTEL. You can think of what has surprised you politically. You know, you can think of a political population. You can think about what has surprised you economically in terms of society, technology, environment, very big one, and also our legal systems. Is there anything that you observe in those that you did not expect? Rachel, you'll help me with time. Oh, Brenda. Yes. Okay, I, 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 okay, that's because I've seen that the distinctions that you've drawn, political pastel, using the acronym that you've just uh, yes, mentioned. Yes, pastel. Um, but somehow, I kind of feel as though 
Okay, when, when, when you put the question to us, yes. what has surprised you the most in the past 20 years? Yes. Generally, when I say like the quality of life, in my view, has regressed. Uh -huh. But I still see, feel as though that it's in all of those, this, it's very hard for me to delink and say this is political, this is social, this is economic, this is, I feel as though it's, it's a whole thing. Yes. Which I'd possibly describe as political. Yes. So if, if, if I say it has regressed, I'd say yeah. like um, elections are stolen, political. Yeah. Like okay. if, if we were to go by that acronym. Um, 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 think of the mm. earnings versus the cost of living. That's economic. Yeah. Think of the way people treat other people. So that's society. If think of yes. um, how we are so, um, how we are so, we use a lot of time, an inordinate amount of time on our phones and social yeah. media technology. So like, environment goes without saying. Yes. Legal systems, I mean the law f for me has always worked for the elite. So like, mm. I kind of approach it from, it's really one thing, yeah. as opposed to, um, this is political, yeah. pigeonhole the society, pigeonhole economic, pigeonhole legal. Yes. Yeah, so it's about it. That's fine. Would anybody else like to comment? Anybody else like to share the evaluation of the past 20 years? Um, no, I was saying that it's, it's almost difficult to do because it's the only 20 years I know that are, you know, within that time frame. Uh -huh. So comparing it. So for me, what, what's really striking is like children mm -hmm. um, and how so many of them seem beyond like um, just somehow more spiritually aware. Uh -huh and more wise and um, more insightful than what I imagined children were before, though I wouldn't know. Um, and yeah, Yvonne was saying that like by the same token, they also are less um, rosy-eyed in uh -huh. that there's an awareness of how dire things are. Maybe wow. it's unconscious. Uh -huh. Um, I just think of uh, this um, Swedish girl when you mentioned Greta. This, Greta. Yeah. 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 And fu yeah, so funny enough, like I mean, I think that is what's on my mind. Is okay. like so, there's so many little people mm -hmm. like Greta mm -hmm. that you just you don't know where it's coming from. They yeah. just seem like these epic heroes, um, and they have this power because Greta is not the first person to be concerned concerned about this issue, but somehow uh -huh. she's causing all of these ripples. Yeah. Um, and I think on the flip side is just so how how um, quickly we're destroying the planet yeah. and like how every day we have so many species dying. Um, that to me is just really horrific. Okay. Oh, that's a really good environmental destruction. Anybody else? Just adding to what she has said. Uh -huh. um, uh, well, uh, there, there seems to be a, an increasing... Uh, uh, a, a greater cynicism, mm -hmm. not just um, among, I think, in, in the world, or is it, I, I wonder if it is cynicism or a sense of uh, hopeless, not hope, I, I'd hate to use the word hopeless, almost as if a not knowing, the answers, the absolute answers are no longer there. Mm -hmm. um, but linked to that is probably, um, I've been totally sh shocked, frankly, by the disintegration of, for lack of a better word, of the Western absolutes. Uh -huh. You know, the Brexits, the Trumps, the, the rise of fascism, all, mm -hmm. all the assumptions of, uh, maybe it's fall of, a fall of one set of empire. Yeah. And, uh, and linked to that is I'm completely struck by the rapid, rapid rise of China. Okay. Yes. Ah, increasing China. <laughs> Not the ceramic in your house. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Don't limit yourself to my pastel model. That was just to catalyze something. Um, mine is um, the last, uh, how do I say, like the, uh, the breaking of the human connection and the human story. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like as the world progresses, our humanity is sort of dying. So I, I wonder what 50 years from today will look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very important point. Tribalism. Anybody uh, else? I think um, mine just 
tied to what guys are saying is uh, a, a loss of meaning. Loss of meaning. Uh, the, the question of meaning is becoming more more existential by the day. Yeah. Also, if you could say your names as you give contribution, oh, it make it easier to remember. Oh, sorry. Hi, um, I'm Joe Kobuthi. Joe. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Yes, at the back. So, take him on. Yes, yes, of course. Good. We have time. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Owen. Uh, on a brighter side, kind of, uh, I'd like to say that for the last 20 years, I think we have a lot of educational resources mm -hmm. that have been becoming more and more available, some through legal ways, some through, honestly, pirating and yeah. stuff. But uh, uh. I feel like growing up, the, especially in English, uh, there has been an increase in access I have to education mm -hmm. that is essentially free. So yeah. uh, other than that, however, the one thing I notice is as time goes by, I also have less and less time to actually use those resources. And I mm -hmm. feel like a lot of adults end up like underestimating how much of an impact, for instance, the internet has done in our lives and how much potential we have for improvement from that. The internet has stripped our attention. This is attention economy. Okay, uh, does anybody else want to chime in? Brenda? Oh, we, oh, we're good, oh, sorry, five minutes, thank you. So, um, basically, this was like taking the pulse of the time, uh, what they call zeitgeist. Like, what does it look like if an alien were to come in and look at 2019, what does it look like? You want as, as, as broad a sweep as possible from many different angles in order to evaluate the time that you that you are in. So these are the things that are going to be really important when you're you know, building your world. You have to see what this context looks like. And then you can now begin to ask further questions about this context. So this is really important. Uh, I've taken a picture of this. I hope you've all also made note of these. Have you all made note of these? We'll come back to them. I'll ask you questions about this. One minute. So the first was quality of life regressing, uh, children becoming wiser, more savvy, aware of environmental destruction, the increase in cynicism and uncertainty, fascism, uh, rise of China and other centers of power, uh, the breaking of human connection, loss of meaning, increase in education, and the, um, what do we call this? Lo less time because of the internet, attention being split. Now, the thing I want to move to with the next 20 minutes, first of all, I'll, I'll comment a bit about this. There's a guy called, what's his name? There's a guy called Kevin Kelly, who was a former editor of Wired magazine. It's a, a tech journal. And he likes to give this analogy about how it's impossible to predict how the path of an individual stream when it's raining, it's impossible to follow what path that individual stream will go. But when you zoom out, it's possible to see where rainfall as a whole will go. So if you imagine hills like this, and it's raining on these hills, you can't be able to predict exactly what path the water will take but you can be able to say generally that as you follow this water, it will end up somewhere at the bottom of the valley. Are we together? So we cannot know individually how things are gonna play out, but it's possible to observe trends as a whole. For example, and you will answer these questions for me. When we look at something like, when we look at something like population, is it probable or less probable that the population is going to go up or down? It's most probably going to go up. When you look at something like, um, uh, what's, what is the next thing in the pastel? 
P E S T E L. If you look at the trends in terms of um, e the economy, it's generally been expanding. The number of people who are involved in the economy has been increasing. The amount of, of goods has been increasing. Uh, there are obviously arguments about the distribution of that wealth, but there is no argument that the amount of wealth which the world holds is much greater today than it was 20 years ago. That we can see. Uh, you can also see things such as um, when we come to, what others do we have here? Technology. And all of them, if you were to plot them against a curve, this being time, if you go back about 100 years, no, 100, 150 years, humanity hadn't crossed a billion, and we've been around for, depending on what measure you're using, if you're looking at 200,000 years, we've just been increasing almost linearly, and then 150 years plus, we go up like that. You see an exponential curve. When you look at the, the expansion of the economy, it follows a similar curve. When you look at technology, it follows a similar curve. And the problem with these exponential curves is that we don't think like that. The human brain doesn't think in exponential curves. We think more in a linear curve. So if you were to ask somebody what the next 10 years would be, most people will just look backwards 10 years and say, oh, it was like this 10 years ago, so it'll be like this 10 years from now. That's how we think intuitively. Because for a very long time, if you looked even uh, at our grandparents, uh, our great, great, great grandparents, they probably never even used to measure change because the world which your grandfather grew up in was probably the same that, uh, that the grandchild grew up in. But that rate, you can see it even in your own life, has been accelerating. It's been moving faster and faster. So it would be a huge mistake to to follow a linear curve. You have to think exponentially. What is an exponential? If you're counting, just to show you what an exponential looks like in mathematics, if you count 20 steps in linear terms, you'll go 20 steps forward. If you count 20 steps exponentially, you'll go, you almost get to a billion. That's how, that's how it compounds, that's how the progress compounds. And that's the challenge which you have to think about if you're going to situate your story 20 years from now. Okay, so now that we've gone through that small crash course about thinking about context, we're now going to do the next big thing. We're going to talk about this time that we've just described, but we're going to talk about it as a historian 20 years from now. Can we do this? Are you ready? Don't worry about being wrong, because you're almost certainly going to be wrong. So forget trying to be right. It's just about being plausible, that your reader, your reader is able to understand how you got there. And there are many science fiction writers who've done this well. So the first question I would ask you is, most important question, before you write anything else down, is who is the historian? Obviously, the perspective depends completely on the person who is chronicling, 100% on the person who is chronicling. There are some objective events which you'll be able to look at. For example, if in the next 20 years Bangladesh sinks because of the rising sea levels and, okay, so which perspective are you in? Are you a Bangladeshi? Are you somebody observing from, from East Africa? Um, you know, so who's the historian? You have to first of all decide in this story that you're telling, who is he or she? Let's give them some hair. Or maybe this is not hair. Maybe this is like uh, signals being sent to their head and spreading out to other people. It is 2040. So who is your historian? We are now moving into the realm of fiction. Yeah? So use your mind. It can be you. You can be thinking about yourself 20 years from now, or you can invent a character and have this character look. So you write down in the papers that you were given. The second question which you have to ask this is just, this is now storytelling. What 
is their goal. This is the second most important question because the goal is what will determine what you pay attention to in the environment. If this historian is, say, uh, a technologist, for example, the curve which they would be looking at would be the technological curve. And that would play a really, that would play a really heavy role in the evaluations they make in the environment. Or perhaps 20 years from now, we are all technologists because with intelligent machines, the machines are doing all the thinking for us. It's very elementary. When you're in nursery school, in addition to learning ABC, you learn ABC AI. And we all have uh, a connection to, to, to the computer, a brain machine interface. We no longer have to type on, on our phones. We no, have to, no longer have to interact with the machine at all. It's completely assimilated. And we can be in the same room, and this is being recorded, and we can you know, be in the same room with many other people. So we can be Kenya National Theater together with Antananarivo National Theater and many other theaters together, all having this conversation. And what is the goal? What are they trying to achieve in this world? You heard in the, in the things that you pointed out, two things that came out to me very strongly that you're all concerned about. And I don't think you're the only ones. I think a lot of people in the world are concerned about these two things. And that's uh, uh, what the lady at the back had said, tribalism which is basically our disconnection from each other. In a weird way, the technology has brought us together, but it's also pushed us apart. And another thing which I heard come out was uh, environment, which is our disconnection from nature. Do we all have to walk around with gas masks? So what is the goal? You know, pick your fight through which you're going to look at this lens. Even really big stories like, like Blade Runner. I don't know, how many have seen Blade Runner? Yeah, I mean, they still managed to focus the story down onto one character who was a, an, artificial, an artificial human being, and that one character's goal. And it was also kind of a story of self-discovery and you know, big questions like consciousness. So, question number three, which stems from Question number two, what is the consequence of failure? What is the consequence of failure? In order for this story to be juicy and for us to follow along with you, the consequence had better be a big one. If the consequence is, is small, then it's not really that big of a deal whether you, you succeed or fail, and there's no reason for us to pay attention. So it's the other side, it's the flip side of the coin in that goal. If the goal was to protect, say, the Amazon from destruction because some crazy uh, government has taken over in Brazil and they want to like you know completely cut down the Amazon and whatever the consequence of failure is that we'll all be wearing gas masks and we'll all descend into like a Mad Max dystopia and the you know the, the, the if you succeed at the goal you know hooray we continue with our nice breathing in nicely uh, now question number four which I'd like you to ask about the environment the context what do you require? What are the requirements? What does the historian require in order to achieve that goal? And following on that, what are question number five? What are the warnings? If you fail to reach that goal, what are the warning signs that you're about to fail? Is it that there's some legislation which is about to be passed that, that allows uh, the forest to go? Is it that there's a new technology that's made it like super efficient to, to cut down the forest a lot faster? Think about those things. 
Question number six. We have eight of them. Uh, question number six. What are the sacrifices that have to be made in order to reach the goal? Question number seven. Oh, a thing about the sacrifices. Sacrifices can be personal in terms of even sacrifice to your health, um, the tortures that a person goes through, or it can be sacrifice to your, to your resources, to your wealth. What are the things that you're going to have to give up in order to get to that goal? And what are the dividends? What are the rewards that you find along the way? Rewards are like, they are not as big as the goal, but they're the small things, the small joys and, and happinesses, the music, the people, the beauty that you see along the way as you're going toward this goal. And of course, question number eight, what are the lessons that the historian learns as they go through this story from beginning to end? Because some things are going to, if you look at your own life, you're not the same person you were 20 years ago. There are certain things that I've seen that have completely disrupted your opinion of the world. And there are other things that you've seen that have been, you know, quite uh, <laughs> confirming. So this is what makes it interesting. And another thing about question number eight is that this is what they call in, in screenwriting a change arc. If if the, if the character does not see anything change in their environment or all their assumptions are confirmed, it's not a very interesting story. But if they are tested, if their beliefs are really tested and we see how that shifts, we feel as if we ourselves have shifted. And a lot of people come to stories and come to whatever format the story is in, they want to see what transformation is possible through this story. Have you written all those questions down? I wish I had more than one whiteboard. I would have just stuck them side by side so that we wouldn't have to erase. So just take five minutes to think about this. The first person to finish writing can throw up their hand. And then we'll have some fun. Shot. Have you finished answering these questions? Okay. My name is Future Historian. I was born in 2001. I am 41 years old. When I was a little boy, we used to swim in the rivers and drink without any typhoid. I would run home and eat lettuce on mommy's table, fresh from our shamba. 
in 2001, the sun would shine and the rain would fall. <laughs> I'm just having fun. Has anybody finished answering the eight questions? Yvonne, do you mind if I put you on the spot? <laughs> in the interest of in the interest of us making good use of the hour. Yes. Walk us through. Let me clean this. Is it okay if I clean the board? Do you all have the eight questions? Can I raise the board? All right, thanks. Okay, Vaughn, take us away. Unfortunately, I went a bit dystopian. No worries. <laughs> Okay, um, I haven't finished, but we'll answer the questions as we yes. go on. So, um, um, my historian is, uh, where are we? Anyway, my historian, I'm just looking where I put the notes. Oh, oh my, in, uh, my historian is an artificially intelligent in enhanced humanoid or cyborg. So, he, born human, but has got all sorts of machines and things installed in in him, her, um, mostly made in China, but installed in the African Union. Mm. And, and, uh, and the African continent has kind of agreed that it is, after all, an African. Poor them. Anyway, um, its its role is to, OK. OK. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, its goal, well, the official goal is to archive uh, the entire, um, um, uh, well, pr primarily the African spaces, but also, you know, tr trends, uh, 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 aspects of the world uh, for, supposedly for the strategic, mostly for data, it's, not, it's no longer necessarily for education, for data advantage. And uh, and strategic dominance mm -hmm. um, of uh, of if you want of the story of the world. Yeah, uh, kind of the big thing is the big competition is the, uh, the 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 space that has control of the story of uh -huh. the world. Okay. Um, um, the consequences of failure. Mm -hmm. Huh. Hmm, I haven't thought about. Well, but perhaps the consequences of failure is that at, the, at this moment, this thing has the strategic advantage. The consequences yes. of failure would be um, the, not only the loss of that advantage, but the, uh, there'd be multiple stories. There'd be a kind of the assumption is that there'd be a chaos of stories, mm -hmm. and we're all supposed to abide by one story of the world. Okay. There's actually a word for that. What? It's called model theism. Model theism. Okay. So you have one model about how the world is, and you know. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and everybody is supposed to adhere to that, and it's yes. sustained. And and uh, anybody with an alternative opinion is also archived by the, our historian. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what was the other question? Uh, oh, to, to achieve the goals. Uh, so. Or oh, consequences. What are the What are the requirements that that this? Uh, what What was uh, the historian called? Ah, okay. We need to give it a Did name. Did you give him a name? No, I hadn't. Uh, um, we can call him Kenny, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny, Yaren. Which is I, Kenyan. I Kenyan like person. that. Yeah. <laughs> Kenny, Perfect. Right. So, mm, 
So what do you say? The, 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 the next question was the consequence. So what, uh, you, what, what requirements do they need to the, what requirements does he need that he does not have? Oh, I'm assuming it's a he, could be a he, he it's, it's, it's a he, an she. AI. Yeah, it's an AI, so. yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. It's a machine. It's, it's, uh, but originally human, but everything, human. you know, everything, you know, the, uh, okay. things have been put into the body and things uh -huh. like that. So by all extents and purposes, okay. yes. So what, what does, what does uh, it require that it doesn't have right now? Uh, wow, what it doesn't, it has, what it, what it actually needs in order to mm -hmm. secure its ambition mm -hmm. is the, the, the control of the will, the, it, 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 no, it's, it, the will of others. It's, it's very important uh -huh. that the imagination, people do not, the only imagination others receive are that which is put forth and sustained. Mm. Um, okay. And because we are all wired and hooked up, uh -huh. you know, so that has been very, you know, simple to do. Control free will. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Remove randomness. Yes. It, okay. ran, yes, it has, yeah. Uh -huh. what, are, what are the warnings of this dystopia? What are the warnings that uh, this noise, model theism, chaos, nonsense information, meaningless, what are the warnings that that's happening? What, what begins to fail and how do we as the audience in this story know that things are going wrong? Uh, things are going wrong. Yeah. Um, there, there seems to be some, um, um, uh, 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 what do you call it? What, what's happening? Um, I don't know, guys. Help me think. How 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 would you make it? I not thought that far. What would mm. would be mm. interesting? It's a it's a really interesting really interesting question, and I can see even the challenge of of this exercise. Yes. Like, what will the world look when um, when we have just so much information that even school becomes nonsense? When everything is available all the time. Like, she sounds to me like Alexa, like Alexa on steroids. <laughs> so what's, what becomes the point of, of our existence from a meaning standpoint? Well, what are we looking for? And, and how does that show up in our day-to-day -day life? What, mm. does, what does that do to our experience since we, we spend so much time in school, so much time, you know, like gathering data, what, what do you call these think tanks, government think tanks and whatever, when all that is, is available instantly and their and the neural nets just talking to each other and, and learning on our behalf, then what becomes, what, uh, do, we, what, what do humans look like or do we? I, oh, so what, the warning sign in that particular, in this particular world simply, when, when, when we notice things began to begin to fail, is yeah. suddenly the kind of information overload the human being experiences. Yeah. So in the middle of the streets, in the middle of conversations, people uh -huh. just stop. Ah, they they become uh, epileptic. I think it's a kaya, it's a catatonic. Uh, information uh, epilepsy. Yes. So it's not the machines shutting down; it's the humans yeah. shutting down. Okay. Some people will just call that meditation. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so those are the warnings that we are going toward. That we are becoming zombies. Okay, cool. Um, what are the, what is the next one? What are the sacrifices that uh, this guy is going to have to make to avoid that consequence? Hmm. Okay, I guess. You can always revise. I want him to be a negative. The... I want him to be a negative character, but he's seeming. Uh -huh. uh, as you think about him, one be he be starts to become a little more positive because uh -huh. to respond to that, I was thinking maybe he she, yeah. um, in order to uh, suddenly is you know because he's an his historian mm -hmm. um, uh, and he's archiving. So it's a choice. He the job his original her. Oh, its original job was the archiving of of moments of history and gathering the data. Mm -hmm. But he has to, in order to stop this kind of the catatonia, yeah, catatonia the, mm -hmm. the spread of human catatonia, yeah. um, it has to uh, move away, step away from mm -hmm. its original mission ah. in, oh yes, in order to gain, uh, so away from data and, and start to look at the human being, to start to figure out, okay, wow. what's... <laughs> so it starts out trying to control 
the randomness of the human agents, but itself, it starts becoming human. It starts it's, becoming more random itself. Yes, in a, it has to do that in order to understand, instead of that to understand why why yeah. humans was it, why humans are freezing, stopping. Uh -huh. Okay, it sounds to me like this 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 character is a lot like us <laughs> when we think about uh, when we think about ourselves and like what lacking that archive has meant for us. Are there ways in which we are catatonic right now? I don't know, things to ask. Um, what are the rewards of, of this world? What are the things that, uh, that as a reader, my eyes will pop open and be like, wow, you know, this is an amazing universe. Hmm. Oh, the, the, that, yeah. that particular, the, the way this, the world in this, is... In this world that you're describing. Well, you know, everything works. You push yeah. a button, uh -huh. you go to an, an ATM-like machine and your yeah. food is delivered, except you pay for it, yeah. except you don't need money. Everything is, it's all hooked and wired. And yeah. um, that whole ideal that we all imagined we wanted, mm -hmm. we've got it. Uh -huh. So as you drive the character through this, we would have to, we'd have to see what, what lessons are learned, what changes go through. Mm -hmm. Did you get that far, or are you on your way there? No, not, no yet. Way. not yet. Not yet. Not okay, yet. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken who'd like to? We have five minutes. Anybody who'd like to give this a, a shot? Um, okay. <laughs> oh, let me take a picture of this first. Yeah, thank you for that character. Kenya droid. <laughs> Let me erase. Is there anyone else that wants to go? <laughs> it looks like you are the one. <laughs> In five minutes, give us your story. All right, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know how I feel myself judging this a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, I'm just going to spit out exactly what came to mind. Yes. Um, and the, so the future historian is an artist. Mm -hmm. And I just see the artist existing in a world where there's exponential change and continuous destruction. And um, that there is this need to innovate and iterate like all the time in order to succeed and also survive. Um, and so the artist becomes like the hero in any situation. So um, the goal is for the artist to kind of be embedded in different companies um, and organizations and to help like help them survive basically. Um, that creativity ultimately is the most important thing in this new world. Um, and, yeah, I was thinking about, uh, so the goal is ultimately survival. Mm -hmm. um, what is the consequence of failure? Uh, ultimately, it is death, because people are dying a lot faster, and I am thinking about the environmental aspect, mostly. And... Um, the requirements mm -hmm. are for the world in general to be more agile. Um, so, like, a the artist has to have like more credibility within that space. Yeah. Um, but in general, everyone needs to be more agile, mm -hmm. and the speed of inaction needs to be a lot faster. Okay. And you need to have a community of actors because one person acting alone is not. Mm -hmm. Enough. Community? Yeah. Okay. What does this uh, hell world look like? What are the warnings of this hell world? As I, as I walk through the future streets, as yeah. I go to the future environments, give me a taste of this hell that you're describing. So actually, I know it sounds hellish, but mm -hmm. I don't really judge it as hellish. Yeah. Like, I just think it is a world that is... Con like. If we're constantly being flooded, for example, mm -hmm. is a house mm -hmm. the house that we imagine now? Mm -hmm. Like, are we floating pods in the ocean? Can we just f 
uh-huh. kind of float above it. Um, Floating houses. Yeah, like if it's if if there's been some type of invention mm-hmm. for. I just imagine like communication changing mm-hmm. really quickly. Maybe like the material form is no longer as important. Mm-hmm. The physical form is no longer as important. Maybe people are communicating like without having to be in the same room, which is I yeah. guess what we do a lot now anyways. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it sounds like you're describing virtual reality. If your experience of the world is mediated through your brain, and if yeah. you can and if you can bypass physical environments to get to the brain, then why do you need the physical environments as much? If in order for me to to feel that I am in uh, I, I'm driving through Nairobi National Park, mm. I don't have to drive through Nairobi National Park and you know blow up exhaust fumes. I can just sit in my chair and through mm, exactly. and feel feel everything right down to the breeze on my face. Then, which, you know. yeah, which brings me to the point that, like, I think that maybe people will actually be more empathetic and more yeah. connected. Absolutely. This is, uh, this is actually very much, this is actually very much present. All we are doing is just improving the hardware. But this technology mm. has been here for the past 20 years or so. We're just getting more computational power uh, because, peop- because everybody has cell phones. We are now turning those cell phones into screens and... Yeah, Mm. very interesting. Uh, I could ask you a bit more questions about embedding yourself everywhere. You don't mean literally embedding him or herself everywhere. You mean this more like through the information. Um, I kind of did think literally. Literally. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. So, yeah, like the artist is kind of the hero that saves the day in in each organization or company or community. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, and so death would mean that um, the information vector which the artist represents disappears. No. Ah. Um, death as in? Physical death. Physical death. OK. Interesting. So if you if you if you look at basically exactly the if you look at if you look at the structure that I was laying out, mm-hmm. basically the whole story is just a tension between the thing that we want and the thing that we don't want as the audience. We are just basically oscillating between those two things, and that's the perspective of the historian. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I hope I hope this has been helpful. When you when you list all these things, usually how I do it is that I take cards like the ones which you have. I write the answers to all these questions. I write them down because the biggest challenge that you face as this future historian, as this writer, is getting to a point where you don't know what happens next. Writer's block. And when you've asked yourself these questions, I know it seems like very tedious and, you know, but if you ask these questions in the beginning, you're much less likely to hit that roadblock because you have all those all those answers. Now, for the final stage, I think we should have about 15 minutes left. So I'll try and go through this really quickly. And I'm so honored to have a, a writer in the audience. <laughs> they will recognize all these steps. So the last stage is now thinking about our story structure. Now that you have all these little pieces of information, it's like doing forensic work. Think of yourself as like a detective, a future detective. Now that you've collected all these little pieces of information on the notes, who's your writer? What does the environment look like? Uh, what is you know how what, what is our mode of transportation? What do we eat? Where do we sleep? Are we in floating houses? Are we in underground, uh, etc.? When you have all those pieces of information. That is your universe now. And now you have to take us through a story. And the two variables which you have as a storyteller are A, time, which we can represent as a y-axis. Uh, sorry, as an x-axis. This is time. Here you have the beginning. And you have the end. 
regardless of what medium you're writing for, whether you're writing a novel or a, or a film script or whatever, you're going to have that. And then on the y-axis, what do we have? Anybody wild guess? It's super simple. Emotion. So here we'll put smiley face, and we'll put frowny face. You've seen in the symbols of theater, they usually show you two heads, one smiling, one frowning. The smiling face being a comedy, the frowning face being a tragedy. The definition of a comedy and tragedy is basically one in which the hero or the historian reaches their goal. So they go through the whole thing and then they get to their goal. You put a smiley face. When you don't get to your goal, you call that a tragedy. So here's a very typical story format, and I don't want you to write a typical story, but just so that you know what it looks like. You've seen this a thousand times before. We start out in a normal, we start out in a normal state emotionally. You're somewhere here. Then there's a trigger incident, boom! Then things get start to get bad, 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 bad. And then at some point, the hero starts to figure out something about the, what made things go bad, and they start to improve their situation a bit. But just as the situation is improving, boom, things start to get bad, 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 so bad, you have like worst case scenario. All is going to hell, you know, that death which you are describing is about to come. And then they figure it out, and then you have a great resolution at the end. Ta-da! This is a very typical Hollywood film. The problem with this, I mean, okay, it's... So this structure helps you plan out your, your story. So if you know, for example, that you're doing a TV series over six months, you can space this out. You know that uh, at this midpoint, I'm somewhere close to three months. I should be approaching my first turning point at, um, after one month, etc. It helps you plan out where you put out those pieces of information. So the elements, the questions I was asking you are the information that you're going to reveal. You see, at what point do I tell people about this? At what point do I introduce this great danger? Probably somewhere near the beginning. At what point does the worst case scenario show up, that danger, death that you're talking about, etc. So that's how you lay the information out. But a story doesn't have to be like this. There are some there are some storytellers who go backwards. They can, start, they can start somewhere in the middle, go backwards, move through the center, and then end in a resolution like that. There are some people who will go up, down, up, and then end in a tragedy. It's really up to you. The key thing, about, the key thing to understand about your story structure is that the two variables which you're working with is good fortune, which is events that take you closer to your goal, and bad fortune, events that take you away from the goal. And then you're also working with time. Now, 10 years ago, I would not have had to tell you what I'm about to tell you. But now that we are talking about future histories, and we are in 2019, I will tell you this. In addition to having an emotional axis, which is a y-axis, and a time axis, because of new technologies like virtual reality, augmented reality, we now have another axis. And you're going to hear a lot more about this if you continue telling stories. And we call this the Z-axis. The Z-axis represents space. How many of you have played Pokemon Go or heard of Pokemon Go? Please tell us. Well, what do you know about Pokemon Go? Somebody throw a mic there. <laughs> I wish you were a bit closer. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. So. In Pokemon Go, Pokemon Go is an augmented reality game. And the whole point of the game is to find this character, Pokemon, who is embedded in the environment. So like if, if there's a Pokemon somewhere in this room, I would have to find that character using my phone. So you're searching, you're searching with your phone. 
and your phone like kind of like mediates between you and, and this physical environment. That's augmented reality. So more and more, as storytellers, we have the opportunity to not just limit ourselves to a two-dimensional plane, which is like a, a TV screen or a book. You can now actually embed the story in the environment. And this is not new. The only thing new about it is that we're using technology. When you think about things like happy hour, how people would all be told, if you're at a certain place at a certain time, you can have drinks at half the price. You see? That's a game dynamic which is dealing with the environment. If everybody can, can, can be at the same place at the appointed time, you get that reward. You're going to see much more of this where instead of following James Bond on a 2D screen, you actually get to be James Bond and you get to move around the environment. You're supposed to find this spy who is this person and then maybe somebody else plays that character. And storytellers are going to be more of curators of experience than they are going to be like spoon feeding people. You know. And I would challenge you, especially in the context of Futura Historias, how do you use physical spaces to tell that story? So as I, as a Nairobian, as I'm walking through the streets, when I pass national archives, there's information that's embedded in the walls or there's information that pops up in my phone just because of me being present in a certain environment. And we have a tremendous opportunity. This is going to be a whole new field in, in storytelling. People are going to have to learn because the way we used to tell stories in the past is that I could control what you saw when. I had control over what you looked at. Even as an author, there was a sequence to how you flip the pages. I could delay you getting information at a certain point. What are you going to do as a storyteller when you don't control where a person looks, if they're inside a virtual environment and they can look wherever they want to? You have to become more suggestive. You have to allow people to look where they want and just suggest. You know, you just... So it's super interesting. Now, I would encourage you to, because I think we're, how much time do we have? We're on the clock? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I had so much fun talking to you guys, and uh, thank you for spending your Sunday morning with me, as opposed to the countless other places where you could be, including your blankets. So thank you very much. Five minutes of questions. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Just a kind of practical. A kind of very more pragmatic thing in in the in the in the perspective of the, um, especially the African space. Yes, and, and it's not because not limited to the geography of Africa. Yes, um, um, in terms of the uh, imagining and uh, another way of 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 history of the yes. continent. What what opinions and thoughts do you have on that? Um, what what what's required now in order to take us to a certain place where? Um, the, 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 especially the histories that have been um, buried in, in memory and, uh, and, has been have, and have been lost because of the privileging sea of, of what we call the colonial period. Yes. Means that the older and, and wider histories seem to be dissipating. Yes. What, and uh, what does it mean especially for the future? What, what's your own opinion about that? Thank you. Uh, I'll sit down for this one. Uh, that's a really important question. If you notice in the exercise we did, the very first question which we asked was, who is the historian? So what I see is all the missing perspectives which we've not gotten to hear, and this is their time now. This is the time now to hear from the losers of history, so to speak, the ones who are not the beneficiaries of, of conquest and who did not have the, the mediums to write and get themselves published in academic journals and whatever, who didn't fit the nice, tiny you know, format that stories were required. Now is the time to hear everything else other than that, and God knows we need it. Um, when I look at just my own family, the only branch, the only story that we hear is the one of, of, of basically, like, okay, so my great-grandfather became a missionary. He moved over to the Christian side, which was essentially, uh, which came with European education, European, and all the benefits that came with that, you know, education, whatever, economic advancement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. His brother, who they were really good friends with, did not enjoy that. His brother, because he rejected Christianity, he rejected, uh, he rejected everything. He wanted to remain a, a kisi. As, as they were, and you know, things didn't work out quite well. Now, if, you, if, if we were to tell it differently, I would want to know what happened to him and what choices he made, why he didn't make that choice, and we haven't heard that. 
we hear only the side because that's what has triumphed. When you go outside, it's clear that the European model triumphed. It's clear that the church's uh, Christianity triumphed and everything else. So now is the time to actually. Uh, a point about technology, I think it's fantastic that we have uh, these technologies like virtual reality and, and all these things. I can go back and be with uh, my, my great grandfather Ogendi and see what their world was like. How did they eat? How do, instead of reading in pages, I can actually sit with them, you know, uh, dressed as they are dressed, look at their, their Ugalia Wimbi and, you know, just enter their life. And the technology allows us to do that so much more. We can transcend time a lot better than we could actually dive into those photographs which we see in the archives. Yes? Mm -hmm. Is that not going to be constructed? And is this, isn't this construction also going to be subjective? So still also in the perspective of the historian who mm -hmm. has done the, you know, the construction, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to escape subjectivity. And that's the whole reason why we ask who is the historian? Because there will always be subjectivity. There will always be a perspective through which you're telling that story. So the best way to inoculate yourself from being biased is involve as many perspectives as possible when you're creating this mosaic, like a wiki project, which is why Wikipedia is a much superior uh, encyclopedia than one which just relies on a small group of academics. It'll never be as good as one which in includes the whole wealth of, of human knowledge. So in creating these virtual environments, I see a point at which uh, it'll be an internet, a VR internet, where we all, we, we create this, this, these assets and we're able to just using everything because you have a few pieces of, of what your history was like. You have, you know, fragments, artifacts from your grandmother. I have some from my grandmother and, and my grandfather. We bring all together and we have some sort of digital archive for this and we can build a mosaic which is as close as possible to the world which we knew even knowing that we can never recreate the world because we, we are not there, I don't know. Even, even just in terms of language, the language has changed so much, but you can, you can try and collect as many artifacts as possible. Hi. <clears throat> I think um, the focus, the focus on, on history is, is well, well and good, yeah? Mm -hmm. But my own view is there's too much focus on colonialism, what has happened in the past. Yes, that needs to be told, yeah? But I'm concerned that we are not using literature enough yeah. to tell about what the future can be like, yes. okay? So it's very easy to blame everything on the colonialist, yeah? Uh, and talk about that and the experience of that. But here we are, like where we are sitting in Kenya, 50 years after independence, in the capital city, we cannot provide clean water to our people. Yeah, we cannot provide simple education to our kids. So, so for me, the challenge is how can we use literature and telling of stories to deal with this enslavement of minds of the current generation to build a better future, other than hacking back to our past, which, yes, uh, we know those challenges with the past, etc., but I don't see how that is going to help us deal with the current challenges we have. Because I think as a society, we are regressing backwards. Yeah. Uh, as we are not looking to the future and how we can fit into that new future. Uh, so your question was, was how can we avoid doing that? Yes. Basically rewarming yesterday's Ugali. Yes. One of the ways we can do that is through forums like this about future histories where we are not just looking backwards and we, we don't even have to constrain ourselves to just the past 100 years of uh, colonialism. We can go much, much further than that. I hope I didn't uh, emphasize that too much. And there's a quote which was there actually, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Because we don't have, uh, that was, who, who said this? I don't know, I hope it's not Steve Jobs that I'm regurgitating, yeah, it, it, one of those people. The best way to invent the future is, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So, um, really it can go any which way. Right now we are at an intersection of possibilities, depending on the choices we make now. 
And what I would do if I was the king of uh, Africa <laughs> or, or an influential person is that I would definitely invest a lot more in exponential technology. I would invest a lot more in education. I, I am so grief stricken that education is not among the big four. I see housing, I see healthcare, and what else is there? There's housing, healthcare, industrialization, and um, something else. Education should have been number one because, you know, really we're at the point in history where we are wondering what, what, what the function of human beings is, even as economic agents. So invest more in education, invest more in <laughs> exponential technology, and let's build a future. Thank you, I think that's all the time I have. If you'd like a copy of my book, please see me after I hop off the stage. I have a bag full of them, and uh, let's build a future.